It'd be terrible if I was the only one here, amen? But anyway, I'm glad you're here, and I'm going to do whatever I can this week to bring you a lot of the Bible to you, okay? A lot of the Word. But um, how many have never met me before? Raise your hand up, okay? Okay, well, then I guess I'll tell a little bit about myself. Don't want to give you the whole story, okay? I got saved in 1964. It's been 60 years ago. Uh, this past September 9th, I came to Christ. And, uh, and my grandfather was preaching, and he, I came forward in the invitation and gave my heart to Christ. In fact, I preached from the same pulpit. I was able to get that pulpit in, in Missouri and take it to Iowa when I went up there. So I get to preach from my grandfather's uh, pulpit. But uh, anyway, you, I'm telling you more than why I should, okay? And uh, so then uh, I uh, was called to preach when I was a teenager. I never went to Bible college. Uh, I went right from being a called to preach to going out on the streets and preaching. And, and I began to create at work where I was at. I began to create Bible studies for people I worked with. And uh, it's a long story there. And then God called me to into a full-time Christian service when I was 19. And uh, so I started serving the Lord in our local church there. And I uh, stayed there 17 years as the assistant pastor and bus director, youth director, you name it, all the titles I had. And, uh, and then in 1993, Alice and I moved to Fort Dodge, Iowa, and we started a church there 31 years ago this past Sunday, okay? And, uh, and so it's been incredible. It's been uh, what God's done there. And so I, I think that's enough about me. We did, um, I tell you about some things in the ministry there. And I just ask if you would stop by and pick up these pieces of literature, just if you would, so you can pray for us. One is for our Bible college, okay? We have a Harvest Baptist Bible College there. And uh, the uniqueness of this college is the fact that we teach spiritual warfare, a four-year course on spiritual warfare. If you take pastoral or missions, you have to take four years of spiritual warfare training. Uh, this ministry is called Hebron. Please get this brochure. There's not many back there, but get, get one. Pray for this, and what it is, um, uh, when, a, when a pastor falls, uh, maybe into depression, or maybe uh, his wife into depression, or one of his kids, or maybe in sin, fails morally or something, uh, what we've done is we've given them a place to go. We have three apartments that we house pastors and their families. We don't charge them anything. They come, we take care of the utilities, and they're everything for them. We just take care of it. We've had them come for eight months. We've had them come for three and a half years. We've got some that decided they were just going to stay with our ministry, and uh, I think we've done 19 families. Uh, I've gone through Hebron now, and uh, that is a huge ministry. When you think about 1,500 pastors, missionaries, and full-time Christian service uh, are leaving the ministry because of failure, uh, maybe moral failure, whatever, and uh, every month, 1,500 leave the ministry. So you get your brain wrapped around that. Also, if you'll pick this up back there, this is a card called Winning the Invisible War. All it is, I ask that you put this on your refrigerator or someplace, and you pray for this conference, April the 8th, 9th, I'm sorry, April the 6th through the 9th. And uh, it's our 20, I think it's our 22nd, yes, uh, annual spiritual warfare conference. Uh, back on the table there is this series right here, Facing, Accepting, and Embracing Adversity. I'm going to be doing that in the next three nights with you. And so that's on CD and also on DVD. Also back there is what I did the last time I was here. I believe it's called It's All in the Head. And I dealt with strongholds, uh, imaginations, and um, knowledge, and, and how to take thoughts into captivity, and then how to maintain freedom. The first time I was here, I did closing the doors, 12 doors that we can open up to demonic activity and how to close those doors and then how to maintain freedom after we got them closed. I got back there. This, um, this one's called Yielding Your Rights to God to Overcome Anger. Um, you know, if you got an angry husband, buy it for Christmas for him, right? Huh? Um, but anyway, this one here, I tell you, I just did a series on anger. And all anger is a result of not ha is having unyielded rights. We feel like people are violating our rights. And God has called us to give up our rights to him. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Doesn't go very well for us, does it? We don't want to do that. And then this one's called Stepping In and Out of Depression. I did one on a uh, biblical view of depression, and then I got depression, and then I did this one here, okay? So when you didn't have depression, you don't know what you're doing when you're talking about depression. But if you ever have it, 
that's that's what I learned through my three bouts of depression. And uh, so this book's called We Rest Not Number One. We Rest Not Number Two is out there on the table. It's a yellow one. And uh, this is the first book that I published. And and then uh, this one just came out last April. This one's called uh, Relinquishing Humanistic Religion Through Authentic Faith. And what it's dealing with is uh, it's a call for God's people to leave our humanistic ways in our churches and our lives. And you may not even recognize it, but churches are filled with it. In fact, in our Bible colleges, we are training young men to be humanistic, whether we know that or not, instead of living by faith. And so I, I just want to be a promoter of faith and believe in God. And so, but this session tonight, as we're going to call it, is we're facing and accepting and embracing adversity. I appreciate um, you letting me be here. And I hope that what we'll do in the next three nights, every night is going to build on top of the other night. So you don't want to miss any of this. Um, it's been a life changer for us as a ministry. We've been through 31 years there. It's 48 years of ministry. There's been a lot of adversity, a lot of warfare, a lot of moments in my life where I just thought, you know, and you know what I'm talking about, God, what are you doing? Amen. And uh, and you got to be careful in, in when you get into that mode with adversity. So uh, as we begin here, I want to begin by throwing this up to you here as, is the necessity to understand adversity. The Bible says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 3, look at it on the screen, would you please? It says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. I know there's a little bit of debate on what that is talking about. I'm going to tell you what I think it's talking about. I believe in these last days, and I believe we're in the last days. Now, I don't know if you believe that, and you need to believe that, because if you don't believe that, you are fulfilling Bible prophecy there. Because the Bible says in the last days, people will say, oh, he's been saying that forever. I'm telling you we're in the last days. I could stand here and tell you Bible prophecies that have already been fulfilled. And all of the Bible prophecies that have to be fulfilled before the rapture have already been done. So we're on the verge. Uh, I don't want to get into all that, but... But anyway, it says the last days shall not come except there come a falling away first. In other words, there's going to be, and there is right now, an apostasy out going away from the church. You understand? There's a movement, people leaving the church, leaving God, and, and our, our nation is, uh, you know, we can get all uptight about all that, but listen, it's, being, it's prophecy being fulfilled. Now, when we think about this thing about... Uh, uh, People leaving, why are they leaving? This, this, this falling away will be a result of three things. Number one, because we'll be deceived by false teachers. That's number one on the list. Not number one like that's the big one. I'm saying it because it's not, okay? You would think it is, and we're all always being alert and aware. When you read the Scriptures, you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, read through the epistles of Paul, and get over in Revelation. Did you know that almost every book of the Bible in the New Testament gives a warning against false teachers. It really does. It's all through there. So the, he said, So there would be a falling away because of false teachers. Secondly, because of the desire to be like the world and to be liked by the world, okay? And so that's a falling away. We're seeing that today also. But now here's what I'm going to talk to you about because I think this one is the uh, greatest thing that the enemy's using to get people like you, like me, <clears throat> out of the race and not finish the course, okay? And here it is. You ready for it? I believe it's due to a misunderstanding of adversity. I mean, I'm telling you, are we online tonight, preacher? Okay, I just want to know that. I was so, so there are situations that, that I have had with people, and they, they were broadsided by some adversity, an adverse situation, a devastating situation, and when that happens, you've got to understand the enemy is going to begin to attack that person whenever they're in the adversity, and if we don't understand adversity, adversity will be the very things. You know what the people do all the time? They go, well, if that's the way God is, then I'm out of here. If God didn't help me, then I quit. And that's more reason why people walk out of Baptist churches. It's more than trying to... Uh, Want to be like the world, and it's more than there's more people leaving because they misunderstand adversity than false teaching. Is because okay, so everybody here is going to face it, amen. 
When we misunderstand adversity, the enemy, Satan, uses it to discourage and paralyze the believer. I see people everywhere I go, they've been through the fire, and they've been through the difficulties, and for some odd reason, they are paralyzed in the tracks, and they cannot get up out of it. Now, listen, that's exactly what the devil wants to do. He wants to use your adversity, okay? He wants to use it to paralyze you, so you will become useless and, and uh, in, in the kingdom of God. In most cases, the believer is then hindered from reaching his or her potential in Christ. And when Satan can get us to not reach our potential in Christ, then guess what? People will literally die and go to hell, people that I should be witnessing to. Amen? Now, I want you to get this. This is powerful right here in Colossians 1, 16 and 17. It says, for by him, and that word by him means by the energy of God, were all things created. Now, we all know. And God created everything. Is that right? Amen? And how did he create it? He created it by the energy of his word. The Bible says he spoke everything into existence. Amen? Okay, so now, so, so by him were, what's it say, next two words? All things. Everybody knows it, okay? You can see it, the brown words. Say them with me. All things created that are in heaven, that are on earth, visible, invisible, where they be thrown. Now watch this. Everything that's visible, that's this right here, that's me. We're all visible, but did you know there's an invisible world? That's why this card right here for our national conference coming up is winning the invisible war because there really is an invisible, invisible spirit realm that's going on right now above us. I'm not trying, it's not trying to make fearful or something. I'm just saying that, that, that God created not only the visible, but he created the invisible world. And he says, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. And the next two words, same with me, okay? All things were created by him and for him. And he is before what? All things. And by him what? All things consist. That's a whole mouthful. You know what God just taught you? God just taught you that, that God is in charge of everything. That's what that verse says right there. God is saying to you, I want you to know that all the dominions, all the even demonic principalities and the powers, all things that they were create. God said, I even created the principalities. I created the demonic forces. And he says, I created them. They were created by me. Now watch this. He says, they were also, I created them for me. I'm going to get into that lady, okay? And he, and he said, before all things I was, and by him, the Bible says, all things consist. Romans chapter 11, verse 36, look what it says. For of him, that means God initiated and through him, that means everything that happens in your life has to go across God's desk before it ever enters into your life. And all things, he says, and to him, that means, um, let's read it again. For of him, and through him, and to him, that means everything goes, is, he initiates, goes across his desk. It's all coming back to him, to whom be glory forever. Amen. This is crazy thinking that, that you and I would think, and it's true, that everything that happens, everything that happens, this is going to be hard for us, okay? Everything that happens in your life, in my life, God is using it to bring him glory. It's true. It's true. Now, amen? Is he in charge? Okay, is he sovereign God? He's absolutely a sovereign God. And if there's anything that's not under his control, that means he's not the God over it. Everything is under his control. The Bible says in Ephesians, in chapter 1, verse 20 through 22, it says, which he wrought in Christ when he raised you from the dead. And what's he talking about? The previous verse, if I had time, I'd go back and get a lot of verses here, but it, what he's talking about, he says, the power that raised Christ from the dead, the very resurrection power of Jesus Christ, the Bible says, was given to us word who believe, in which it was that power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. And where did Jesus sit? Okay, now look here. I'm going to use this chair here. And we have, um, we have uh, God the Father. He sits here. And Jesus went up to heaven, and he sat down at the right hand of the Father. You understand that? Make sense? Talk to me a little bit, okay? Okay, so he says he sits there. And where does Jesus sits right now after he was crucified, buried, rose from the dead? He went up in heaven and sat down. He's at the right hand of the Father, and the Bible says, He's far above what? All the principalities and powers and all the might and the dominion. He's above every name that's named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And so what he's saying is this. 
is where Jesus sits, uh, where his feet is. Uh, look here, the Bible says he has put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over what? What's it saying? All things to the church. Now, now I'm going to tell you something. You know what's good about this? Is if I know everything's under his feet, and I know everything's under his control, and when things seem like they're out of control, I can go back to this and say, no, they're under his control. Amen? Now, that's comforting to me, and you better grab onto that, because let me tell you something, this thing that you're living in, this America that you know, this world that we know, is about to unravel. I'm telling you, it's about to unravel. Someone said to me, well, if President Trump, or, uh, um, President Trump got in, then, you know, things are going to be better. Look here, here, look here, let me tell you something. It could get worse, not because he's bad, but because it, the other side is going to matter because he got in. Do you understand? Come on, talk to me. Well, anyway, things are going to start to unravel, and you and I need to get our our hearts in tune uh, of the sovereignty of God, that God is in charge of this world that's about to unravel. Amen? Look at what Job said in Job chapter 2 and verse 10. Here's what he said. He said, What shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? In all this, Job sinned not with his lips. Now, you know what Job went through, don't you? Amen? Okay, so here he is, he's, got, he's uh, worshiping God, and man comes in and says, Job, you just lost all of your wealth, all your servants have been taken off and killed, and all your, everything you own is taken, and then, no, long story short, guy comes in and says, Job, your kids were all down at the older brother's house, a storm came, the house collapsed and killed all of your kids. Is that crazy or what? I don't know how I would handle that. How would you handle that? All now, I, I don't know what I'd do with one, amen. I don't know what I'd do, but with all of my children gone in a moment, in and uh, no warning. And the Bible says that Job said this God, am I going to receive good from your hand and shall not receive evil? And the Bible says he sinned not with his lips, he not one time cursed God over that. The word evil in Hebrew, when it talks about. Shall we, not, shall we receive good, not evil? The word he, uh, evil means adversity, afflictions, calamities, displeasure, distress, grief, misery, and trouble. Now, here's our problem in America. We have a Christianity that is, in our brain, is supposed to, if we get saved and we walk with God, then guess what? Our life is going to be easy. That's not true. That is a false, that right there is a false doctrine that America Christianity has swallowed, amen, and that's why it's gotten out of balance, and now we have hyper-prosperity and hyper-health preaching, amen? Like, like if you're right with God, then you're going to have money. If you're right with God, you're going to have big house, and you're going to have big cars, you're going to have fancy stuff. Let me tell you something, that is false doctrine, amen? And so uh, he says, Job said, you know, God, I'll receive good from your hand. Am I going to complain to you if I receive adversity from you? And Affliction and calamity and displeasure and distress, grief, misery, and trouble. So what was Job saying in Job chapter 2, verse 10? Let's look at it. Just, it's pretty simple. He, he was saying, what? Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and we shall not receive adversity, affliction, calamity, displeasure, distress, grief, misery, and trouble? Your adversity, that God, that God, Everything everything happens in your life goes across God's desk before it ever comes into your life. Did you know that? You, you understand that? You're gonna have to talk to me, okay? You gotta talk to me. I I get stuck when I just I don't want to leave if you're not getting it. You understand? The way you let me know you get it is you nod your head, but not with your eyes closed. That means you're nodding out, okay? Uh, you say amen or uh, wave at me or something, you know? Okay, all right. So your adversity will either one do one or two things. You ready for this? It will make you bitter, okay, or it's going to make you better, okay? Do you understand me? Okay, so adversity does two things to people. It makes them bitter or it makes them better. Now listen to me carefully. The only thing that determines it, whether you get bitter or whether you get better, is how you respond to your adversity. If you learn how to respond to your adversity, then what will happen is you will begin to find, and I'm getting ahead of myself, you'll begin to find that there's eternal divine purpose behind everything that you suffer. Everything that you suffer has divine purpose behind it. If you do not find, there it is, I told you. If you do not, have, if you do not find the eternal purpose 
or your adversity, it will make you bitter. It will make you bitter. Now, how many of us, and we're not going to tell on ourselves, but we know of people that things, things, difficult things happened to them, and they got bitter against God. How many of you did that? Okay, I know people like that. Okay, you won't admit. Okay. I remember as a little boy, my dad was uh, um, a drinker, and uh, he was uh, a smoker, and he drank six pack of beer on the way to work, six pack of beer on the way home. He smoked cigarettes, chain smoker, and he died when I was three. Now I'll be honest with you, I I don't remember my dad. Not one bit do I remember my dad, except. Him laying on a couch in Marietta, Georgia, on Christmas Day. I don't remember his face. I remember a man that was sick on our couch. That's not, it was my dad, and him putting a train set together for me and my brother. I was three. My, I was two. My brother was three, and uh, that's all I remember of my dad. He passed away when I, was, like I said, when I was three. My brother was four. My sister was six when he died. I remember one day I was sitting on the front porch and I was wondering. Why don't I have a dad? And that began to get in my heart. And then my cousin and my uncle went by driving by, and they had fishing poles sticking out of the back of the pickup truck, and they waved as they drove by. In other words, my uncle was taking his son to go fishing, and I said to him, in my heart, I said, I think this stinks. I think it stinks that he gets to have a dad, and his dad takes him fishing. And I want to tell you something, that began to swell up in my little heart. And, uh, and, and so at that point, I had to figure out, no one taught me how, but some way I figured out that, you know what, God is in charge of my life. It was that, when I began to question that, it was one of the very things that brought me to the Lord. I got saved that year when I began to question that. For instance, let me ask you something. Who was it that killed Jesus? Think about this. If you said the devil and the demons, you'd be right. They were involved in killing Jesus. If you said the Jews did it, you'd be right about that too. We know the Jews were involved in it. If you said Judas played a part in it, along with the Roman government, we'd all be right, right? All of them played a role in it, right? In other words, in, in, in humanistic looking, it was like man is doing bad to somebody good. Is that right? Man, bad men are doing something to a good man, Okay. Uh, watch this, but look at what God's Word says about this event, about Jesus dying on the cross and people killing him. The Bible says, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from the present evil world, and all of it was what? According to the will of God, the Father. Did you hear me? In other words, uh, Jesus, uh, Jesus, God's Son, God's Son, uh, allowed humans to beat him and open his back wide open where they could see his bodily organs from the backside of himself. It was wide open all the way to the ribs. Okay, you understand? It's hard for you to imagine this. And then they took our Lord, the Lord of glory, and they nailed him to a tree, and he's hanging there on a tree, and then he begins to suffocate on the cross, trying to get oxygen. He pulls himself up that cross, splinters going into that open wounds in the back, and then to get oxygen, he pulls himself up, he can't hold himself. He lets himself go back down. They put a crown of thorns on his head, piercing the most vascular area of the body, which is the forehead. Blood is pouring out. Blood's pouring out of his side, blood, uh, his back, and his hands and his feet. And then the most terrible thing that they did, in, in my opinion, is they shamed him to the shame of all shames. They took, they took and stripped him naked in front of his mother, in front of John, in front of Mary Magdalene, and all of Jerusalem. Now, understand this. If that was you and that was happening to you, you hear me? If this was happening to your son, okay, you hear me? You understand? I mean, how many of us could in our brain really get it wrapped around that this is the will of God? That what happened to Jesus Christ was all according to the will of God and our Father. Amen. The Bible says in Acts 2.23, And him being delivered, he was delivered by what? He was delivered by the predetermined counsel and foreknowledge of God. In other words, God the Father already saw down the path. He already saw the cross. He already saw what they're going to do. And it was all predetermined in the foreknowledge of God for his son to go through that. Now, if he goes through that, let me tell you something. If he goes through that, and he went through that because of the sovereignty of the Father, 
And let me tell you something, everything that you and I go through, everything we go through, is it, we go through it underneath the sovereign hand of our God. Now this, this is going to, you're going to go, you know, I never thought about adversity like this. I, I want you to think biblical because see why I'm saying this is because when the persecution comes, listen, the church in America is not going to be raptured out before the persecution comes. I didn't, I didn't say we're going through the tribulation period. I'm saying we're going to receive persecution in this country. And it's already being planned. It's already been schemed. It's already, there are the people already with devices and methods and plans to destroy Christianity in America. And we will become the target. You said, this is not very encouraging. I know it's not very encouraging, but... But the only way I can find the courage in it all is that, you know what? My God's in charge. So here it is. Jesus on the cross, the most unjustified act, the most insidious crime ever committed unfairly to the one person that did not deserve it. By the devil, by the religious crowd, because of your sins, our sins, the Father in heaven is right smack in the middle of all. It was God's idea in the first place. Amen. And even though the devil did it, and the religious crowd did it, and our sins did it, guess what? God initiated it all. And they were what? All these people, they were just simply instruments in the hands of God with a redemptive plan for lost humanity. And let me tell you something. If God, God, if God would not predetermine, okay, if he did not predetermine that his son would suffer, you'd die and go into hell. Amen. Amen? And that, that is a part of God, I'll say it again later, but that is a part of God's economy. That's part of his plan is suffering. Suffering has all kinds of redemptive value in it. We'll come to that. So how did Jesus walk victoriously through that adversity, the worst adversity any man could ever go through, Jesus went through? How do you go through that? With, uh, and here's what the Bible says. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, Despising the shame, that's the, what they did to him, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So how did Jesus do that? You know how Jesus went through that? Jesus, Jesus saw the cross. He, the Father, Son, would, you got to go to the cross. you got to be beaten. You, and, and don't retaliate. Don't say a word. Remember, Job sinned not with his lips. Jesus did not sin with his lips. Amen? And so the Bible says that, that he went through all of that, despising the same, and there was a joy that was set before him. Now, what's the joy that was set before him? You. You, sitting here in church, that was the joy that Jesus had, that he that drove him to go through his adversity, so that what? So that you and I could be his children. Amen? Jesus was able to see the redemptive plan behind his own suffering. And when you're able to find the redemptive plan behind your suffering, it brings value to your adversity. And I want to tell you something. Uh, I'll get into some of this later about different adversities that the Lord's uh, permitted me and, and allowed to come into my life. And, and, uh, and when I discovered that there's eternal value, redemptive, there's a redemptive plan behind all of my suffering, it began. then immediately when I go into adversity, I begin to look for the redemptive plan behind it all. Get a handle on this truth. If you are a human being, as far as I know, everybody here is. I haven't, I'm not sure on some of you, but anyway, if, if you're a human being, you cannot possibly live in an atmosphere where you do not face adversity. You hear me? You cannot live. You say, preacher, now, this is just really negative. No, it's positive. It really is. You'll see it. There's no way you're going to get through this world, this sinful world, and this demonic powers that are all around us without us experiencing some adversity. Amen? No one can position himself or herself to get away from adversity. You can't position yourself for that. You can get all the money in the bank you want to get. <clears throat> you can go to the gym and work out and make sure you're healthy. You can be in church, say your prayers, and you can love God and serve God. But can I tell you something? You're not getting through this life without some adversity. Adversity is part of God's economy. And this is what God, but to be honest with you, this is how God will literally, literally fuels the kingdom of God is adversity. Now, most people never thought about that. Right, let's just take a moment here, okay? Right, I thought maybe I need a little persuasion here, okay? 
For instance, uh, how many of you have ever heard the a lady by the name of Tori Timboom? Anybody ever hear of Tori Timboom? Raise your hand up if you ever heard of Tori Timboom. Tori, okay. Tori, you ought to go read uh, The Hiding Place, watch the movie maybe or whatever, I don't care. Uh, but anyway, The Hiding Place. Um, Tori Timboom was in Germany when the Nazis came in. Her family decided they were going to help the uh, Jews and hide them and, and smuggle them out of the country. And so they built a cavity in the walls and they hid Jews in their house and and, uh, and the Nazis found out about it. They came in. Her dad was a clockmaker. The, dad, uh, the Nazis came in. The Germans came in. And they took uh, Tori's mom and dad, and they put them on a truck, and they took them to a concentration camp. And then they took Tori and her sister, and they took them, these two girls to a concentration camp. And I'm not going to get into all that they suffered, but in that concentration camp, the, the suffering was so bad. It was so terrible. It was so unbelievable, okay? And people, guess what? When that, when that war was over, her sister died in the, in the concentration camp with her. Her mom and dad died in the concentration camp. But Cory lived through all that suffering. And guess what? All of that suffering was a preparation for her to minister to millions and millions of people. Amen? Millions of people got, have been ministered to. By Corey Timboom, because why? Look here. If she wouldn't have gone through that, you had never heard her story. If she wouldn't have gone through that, you had never learned a lesson from Corey Timboom. 2 Peter 4 12 says this, Beloved, think it not strange. Stop right there. Let me just say this to you, okay? Is everywhere I go, I mean, everywhere I go, people say these things to me. Here's what they say they'll say, it's just so strange, that Pastor. I mean, all this, this stuff happening in my church, and, and someone comes up and says, it's so strange. I mean, I'm telling you, it's strange how, how, how our, my marriage is just constantly under attack. Now, look at me. How many of you ever thought that? Talk to me. Talk, talk to me. Okay. One person. i got to get better than that. I can't move on for one person, okay? Thank you. There, everybody raise your hand, sir. Oh, come on, man. So what I'm saying to you is, is people say all the time, it's strange that this stuff's happening. Look what Peter writes. He says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, and don't start acting like it's some strange thing has happened unto you. If it's not strange, if something's not strange, then it's what? It's normal. Talk to me. It's normal. Amen? If it's not strange, it's normal. In other words, what Peter is telling you folks is this. It is normal to have adversity in your life. It's, it's strange for you not to have adversity in your life. He goes on to say, but rejoice. That's always hard to do, amen. And as much as you are what? In your suffering, you become partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. Proverbs 16.4 says this. The Lord hath made, say it, all things for himself. Oh, this is crazy. Yea, even the wicked for the day of evil. Now, wait a second. God makes the wicked. God makes the wicked for the day of evil. In other words, God is even in charge of that. Uh, so when we look at this, the, the Lord has made all things for himself, even the wicked for the day of evil. The day of evil, it means the day of adversity. Every one of us are going to have days of adversity, okay? And, uh, and God, the Bible says God makes things for the day of adversity. It would be good for you and I then to do what? To make up our mind that all of us here are headed for trouble. Isn't that good stuff, huh? Huh? I'm a good cheerleader, all right? Hey, folks, I want to just tell you something. You're all headed for trouble. You're going, I didn't come to church to hear this stuff. I want someone to tell me how to get out of my trouble. You don't need someone to tell you how to get out of your trouble. You need someone to tell you how to walk through your trouble. Amen? You're either headed into a valley, you're in a valley, or headed out of a valley. Now, let me tell you something. The valley is, a, is normal. I, um, oh, mercy's sake. I, I'm going to wait on that. So if you do not handle, but this is important, if you do not handle your troubles, your adversities, your difficulties right, then right around the corner is one just like that one or one bigger than that one. You hear what I'm saying? 
See, because it has been delivered to you by God, and it's for his purpose and for his glory. So here's the deal. It's not like, you know, like I was terrible in school. I mean, I was terrible in school. I hate to even admit that. I love to read. I love to write. I love to study now. I'm studying something I like. I didn't like geometry. I didn't like algebra. I didn't like math. I didn't like science. I didn't like any of this stuff, okay? A good witness here this evening, okay? Amen. I was waiting on you, okay? Amen. Amen. I was expecting my, truth, my mouth of two or three witnesses. Something is established. Okay, good. I hated it. And I remember walking in my senior year in my school, 1970, it would be 1974, uh, in September of 74, walked in my school, and my principal standing by the front door. He said, Smith, in my office. I thought, finish the year out in his office. Now I get to start the year. I thought I'd done something wrong again. I went inside, and here's what Mr. Willard said to me. He said, You're, you are going to graduate in May. Well, that was the intent. And he said, I'm telling you, no matter what, I will not let you come back to school. You are going to graduate. You know what he just told me? No matter what I do, I get to graduate. Amen? So I missed 52 days. I shouldn't say, say this in front of everybody. I missed 52 days of my senior year working, making money, and, and um, I was not, it was not good probably, but anyway. I am the person that they made no child left behind. I'm him. Okay? I'm joking. Okay? Uh, but here's the thing with God. God says, I'm going to bring a test. I'm going to be a trial. I'm going to bring adversity in your life. But you're not going to the next grade until you pass that one. And if you don't like that one and you decide I'm going to get bitter, God will bring a bigger one that will break you. You hear me? Because God's goal in it is that he does a work in you and brings you to the end of yourself so he can get glory through your life. Not one speck of adversity touches your life that God does not know about. Your adversity will never catch God off guard. Amen? I remember Alice and I, we went through a dark spot in our life. It was in... Let's see, we were married August 7, 1976, and um, I was 19, she was 18. It was, I, I don't know, it wasn't very long after that that she discovered she was with child, and, and we began to get everything ready for that to happen. And months got by, we were excited, our family was excited, and uh, one night, we were just sitting at the house, and, and uh I'm not feeling good. I don't remember how many months, maybe four, not maybe not quite five months, maybe in the four and a half months. We were in the pregnancy, and, and uh, she said, I don't feel good. And I said, well, maybe I'll get you to the doctor. And, and so uh, I put her in the car. We lived in a little town outside of St. Louis at that time. We drove 65 miles to the hospital, took her to the hospital, and we went in there, and they put her in the bed. I said, I said, Waited and waited, and then they finally came out and said, you come in, Mr. Smith. And, and there was Alice, and she was really peaked. And, and the doctor said these words to me. He said, uh, Mr. Smith, uh, your wife is going to be fine, and uh, we really could be sure that this baby is going to be okay, that we just need for her to keep her feet up and, and stay off her feet right now and get strong. But from here out to the end of the pregnancy, we got to really take it easy. And, you know, I was relieved about that. Amen? I remember uh, I had prayer with her, and uh, you got to understand, uh, I, when, in those days, if you're my age, you understand this, uh, in those days, you didn't get a week off with your wife for pregnancy, and you didn't get like two weeks off or whatever, okay? I don't know what they do. I, I'm amazed at all that, and I, I would have liked it, but I couldn't. I had to get up next morning and, and um, be at work, and, and so... Um, uh, we had some things going on. Um, so I drove home that night, uh, left Alice, kissed her in the hospital room, said I'll be back after tomorrow afternoon. I drove 65 miles home, went in the house. I lay down in the bed. All the way home, I'm just driving, praising God. I'm dri I mean, I got my hands up praising God. God, thank you. You're going to take care of my wife. And I get the car parked. I go inside and I lay down in the bed. And no more than I lay down in the bed, the phone rang. On the other end of the phone, these, this 
Allison's voice. And her voice was like this. I said, hello. I mean, I was wiped out. Drove for 65 miles there, 65 miles home, in the night. Had to get up early the next morning. Phone rings. I said, hello. She says, I'll say, Marvin, I am. Marvin, I'm so sorry. Marvin, I'm so sorry. I said, Alice, you don't apologize about anything. She says, no, you don't. Marvin, I am so sorry. I couldn't help it, Marvin. I just couldn't help it. I said, I go, what are you talking about? I said, Marvin, I lost that baby. I was trying not to lose that baby. I didn't want to lose that baby. And I'm so sorry I let you down. She took it all on herself. And, and I'm on the phone. I'm like, oh, my goodness. You know, I, I'm praising God that God was going to you know, be good and, and all that. And yet God took my baby. Right? What I did, I jumped back in my car and I drove 65 miles back there. I walked in time and we cried and we wept together. And and, uh, and she, she said, I don't understand why he did this. I don't know why. And she said, I saw the baby, Marvin. Oh, there are times in life things happen. And it's going to happen. Do you understand me? You say, well, maybe you weren't right with God. Well, maybe I wasn't right all the way, 90, maybe I was 98%. I don't know. I don't think that's how God operates, okay? Do you understand that? I think God knew what he was doing, amen? And I, I have to believe that my adversity did not catch God off guard. I had to believe that us losing that baby went across his desk. He stamped the approval of that so that that would happen in my life, so I could stand here tonight, years later, and tell you that God is good even in my adversity. Amen. See, God allowed it. Do you believe that? Uh, you're going to be you gotta get your brain wrapped down. God allowed it. God has permitted it. Amen. God limited it. I'm going to show you that. That's just crazy stuff. And also God designed it to bring himself glory. So all of your adversity, God allows it, permits it, but he also limits it. And he design, God designed, God designed for, in a plan for our baby to be gone. You hear me? It was designed by God. To do what? I'm going to show you a little bit how, to, how it brought him glory, okay? Uh, I want you to understand where it says God has limited it. Look at this scripture right here. Think about it. Psalm 76.10 says, Surely the wrath of man shall praise thee. The remainder of wrath shalt thou restrain. In other words, God is even in charge. If someone is mad at me and they pour out wrath toward me, now watch this here, is the Bible says, Surely the wrath of a man, God says, I can use the wrath of a man to get me praise. And whatever is over and above that, I, I literally restrain that. You know what I'm telling you tonight is that God is in charge of everything. Talk to me, amen? Do you understand that verse now? Do you understand? Talk to me. You got it? This is an important verse for us. Do you understand that verse tonight? Okay, good. I'm telling you, reason why, it's so important to get that. I've had people mad. Can you imagine anybody being mad at me? Why are you laughing at me? That's why I, I did. I, I can't imagine anybody being mad at me. I'm a nice guy, okay? I really am. Pretty much of the time, amen? I've had people mad at me. And, uh, and, and see, here's how much God's in charge. He knows how much wrath to let through on me. And then he knows how much wrath is not me to be able to train. I'm just saying God's in charge of all this. Look at Isaiah 55, 8 through 10. It says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. In other words, here's what I'm saying to you. You know what's so hard for us to do is get our, our feeble minds wrapped around this concept that I'm teaching you. And the reason is, is because his thoughts are higher than your thoughts. His ways are different than your ways. Amen? Yeah. And so, uh, so what do we got to learn how to do? You and I got to, this book, this book has so much of what I'm teaching it. Of course, you can see that. I have a lot of Bible here on tonight. 
And we've got to learn this book so that we can handle adversity properly. Ezekiel says this. He says, Yet the children of thy people say, The way of the Lord is not equal, but as for them, their way is not equal. Now the word equal here means fair. How many times in our life we thought, That's not fair. Amen? Yeah. God, that's not fair. You know, I mean, but that guy's kids come out okay. My kids, some of them are okay, but some are just rebels, and that's not fair. Um, I won't drop a name here, but I have a man that travels out of my church. He's a great, great guy. He's a preacher. He had a devastation happen in his life. He was pastoring his great church. He was uh, 30, you know, he's 52, but he's married 36 years. He was pastoring his church, unbelievable church. I preached for him one time. And uh, this was way back in the year 2000. And uh, he was at a prayer meeting at the church, and one of the deacons pulled in. It was on Wednesday morning at 7.30 in the morning. And the deacon went and said, hey, pastor, he said, well, I think, I think I heard gunshots in your house. And so he left the uh, church house and ran over to the parsonage and went in. And when he came in the kitchen, and then you go in the living room, I've been in this place. I've been right there. And the basement door was open, and his wife, of married 36 years, was shot in the head. And his daughter of 29 years old, 27 years old, was shot in the chest, and both of them were dead. Now, you don't need to know details behind all that. It's such a long, long story. But he told me this, he remembers, uh, he remembers after that happened and the funeral took place and he remembers on a Sunday morning, he's still the pastor of this church, right? And I don't even know how the guy went to the pulpit ever after that. I mean, you thought, imagine what that's like. Or even lived in that house. But he didn't have another house. You know, when a pastor leave, loses ministry, you lose it all. And, and, and so... He said, Marvin, he said, I went looking at the, out the kitchen window, and there was our neighbor up on the hill there, and he had this big 24-foot uh, boat hooked to his big old brand-new pickup truck, and his kids are all hopping in that truck and his wife on a Sunday morning, and they're going out to the fish and, and go out and ski and go have fun. And here he said, and here I am, I'm going to church. And he said, he said I said to God, God, that's not fair. I go to church alone. It's not fair. Can I tell you something? In our brain, we, think we don't even know what's fair in life. We don't even know what's equal. Know this. God said this. The children of Israel said, God, your way is not equal. But God said that as for them, their way is not equal. In, if in your adversity you cannot see that God is willing to do these three things, remember this, he's trying to correct you in something. Number two, he's trying to enlarge you spiritually. And number three, he's trying to get himself glory through your adversity. And if you miss that, if you miss, look here, if you go through the fire, you go through difficult times, dark spots. Listen, I've been to dark spots. I'm talking about where I lay depressed, I didn't, I didn't know if I wanted to live. And I had to get my brain wrapped around that God is correcting something in my life. Correction does not mean God's mad at you. God never disciplines his children out of anger. Did you know that? Never does God discipline you out of anger. We got dads that discipline their children out of anger, moms that discipline their children out of anger, but your Heavenly Father never disciplines out of anger. All of God's discipline, all of God's correction is out of his love for you. So God, I had to get my brain wrapped around. God, you're correcting something in my life. Number two, you are enlarging me spiritually. And number three, you are doing something that you can get glory. And I can tell you, out of my depression, my three bouts of depression, I have been able to see those three things come out of that. God uses your adversity to reveal to you where your walk with him really is. See, if I come up to you tonight and I'd say to you, how's your walk with God? You say, oh, my walk with God's good. My walk with God's great. And can I tell you something? It's easy to sit inside of a church house and sing the hymns and be around God's people and believe that our walk is good. Amen? 
But God will bring adversity to really check that out. The Bible says, if thou faint in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. Now think about this. It's, I used to not like that verse. Have you ever had verses in the Bible you read and go, I'm not going to read that one? Huh? This is one of them. And yet, you know what? It's not a negative verse. I always thought it was a negative verse. It's a positive verse. In other words, God says this, Marvin, I'm going to bring adversity in your life because I want you to really, really know where you're at so that you can sure up the areas of your life that need to be sure up. Does that make sense? So God does us a favor to show us where our strength is small because guess what? Whatever he's showing me today where I'm, my strength is small, it's because he sees down the pipe and says, you got to get this area shored up because that's coming your way. All adversity has a redemptive plan behind it. Everybody say that out loud with me, okay? All adversity has a redemptive plan behind it. No matter what happens in your life, remember your adversity has been designed to touch other people's lives. Your adversity is not all about you. Let me give you a little help. I had a man on my staff. His name was John Brooks. John worked for me for 11 years. He ran my home for troubled kids. He was, uh, and, and I don't like to say he was the best, but he's one of the best men I ever had working in my home for troubled kids. We had 650 teenagers come to our home, and they came from 47 states and five foreign countries, and, and he was incredible. And John began to feel bad, and John began to have a problem breathing, and then John ended up in the hospital, and he was a veteran, so he went over to Omaha, Nebraska, to the Veterans Hospital to get checked out, and John had uh, congestive heart failure. And uh, I went to see John. Now, it's kind of funny, but I went in and seen him. I said, John, I'm going to tell you something now. If you die, I'll kill you. And he laughed. He said to me, he said, uh, he said I, I want to be at the home with you with my, with my, for a long time. But he said, preacher, uh, he whispered, he goes, God brought me in here. You understand what John was doing? John understood that his adversity has been designed by God to touch other people. Amen? Remember I told you about us losing our baby? Well, Alice and I, we went and hid ourselves for about, I don't know, I took a vacation for a couple of weeks and wept together, prayed together, got in the Word, memorized Scripture, and got our heart so it wouldn't get bitter. We no more got home. We got a phone call from a couple that lived down the street from us, and they lady called and says, uh, "Could you and, and Miss Alice please come by the house?" So we got in our car and we drove there. And when we got there, she said, "I just lost my baby." Now let me ask you something. Did you know that God? This is crazy. God will allow me to lose my baby. If all it means, I can help somebody else that lost their baby. Because adversity is not all about you. It's about other people. You understand? And here's the thing. If you don't let that happen in your mind, you'll say, this is not about me. Because look here. When, I, when it's all about you and your, like in my depression, you know what depression is? It's a terrible thing, but I don't want to lighten it because it was deep, and I got a lot of things about that. But um, depression is like having a pity party, but only one person was invited. That was me. Can I tell you something? It's a lone, It's not a very good party. Amen? You know, I, I did. I allowed that depression to be all about me for a little bit. Joseph ripped off by his brothers? Come on, think about it. Here's the answer. This, I know y'all were struggling. Oh, I don't know. You know okay, the answer is this, okay? Joseph, <laughs> Joseph was ripped off by his brothers. In the last chapter of Genesis, Joseph says this to his brothers. Fear not, for I am in the place of God. Am I in the place of God? He says, but as for you, you thought you thought evil against me. 
he says, but God meant it unto good. To bring it to pass as it is this day to save much people. You understand what he just did? Joseph, folks, look here. Joseph went through this hell. Amen? Terrible stuff. I mean, you know this. His own brothers sold him into slavery. Right? And then he went through years of slavery, and then he gets out, and then he gets falsely accused of an immoral act, and he gets put in prison for it. And he stays in prison for an amount of years, and then he gets out of prison, and then God elevates him to a place of leadership, and, and then God sends a famine to the people of God, and those people come to Egypt to get food, when they, a little long story short, to get food, and it's Joseph's family that's coming, and Joseph is saying this: "What you, what man is meaning for bad for my life, God's meaning it for good." You hear me? And what was it all about? To save much people alive. See, those people are going to starve to death. So here's God. Watch this. God sees life from up here. He sees you're there, and he sees the long haul. And so he orders up brothers to put him in a hole in the ground, sell him into slavery. And God's got this guy on a journey. He never complains. We'll see that in just a moment. And then he comes out on the, over here, and, and he gets in, put in prison. And then he gets elevated to leadership. And did you know, folks, did you all know that all of that was ordered of God? Come on. All of that was ordered of God? To do what? To save people. That means there was a redemptive value behind his suffering. And the moment adversity touches your life, God is aware of it. Every bit of adversity that comes into your life is a message from God. It's an important message. Every amount of pain and suffering that I suffer physically, emotionally, mentally, it's all a message from God. You may not like God's plan for the man, but at times God is not interested. I don't like this one. I'll get it straight. Do you know what? I gotta slow down and read it. You may not like God's plan for the man, but at times God is not interested in your plan. In other words, did you know that He's interested in the fact that He gets glory? Your comfort and God's glory may not have anything to do with it. You know what we do? We think that everything God has planned for us means that we can do it. Did you, folks, listen, there are people that live the day they're born to the day they die in terrible, atrocious situations. They never get up, ever, where that day will bring them what you and I had today. You hear me? There are 400,000 orphans in Haiti on naked children on the streets of that island. You know what 400,000 children look like? And they will never have a meal like I ate today. And they'll never be able to sit in a nice place like this. And they'll never have a comfortable bed. And their mom and dads are dead, and they're gone because of hurricanes and earthquakes and because of crime and sex trafficking and, and all of that stuff. God's glory and their comfort may never touch. In other words, my son has an orphanage down there in Haiti, and about 50, 60 kids in it. And these little kids, somewhere or another, they find God in what they're going through. And, and I get around people in America, and they're like mad. Kids in Walmart screaming at their moms, they want something. Huh? And their mom goes, no, no. Okay, if you be quiet, I'll give it to you. And they want. And, and we raise kids thinking everything is about your comfort. Hell. Again, remember Joseph. Long before you ever have a need, 
God has already arranged for your supply through the adversity in another person. Long before you ever have a need, God has already arranged the supply. You say, what do you mean? God's people needed food, right? What did God do? Long before they needed food, he put a man through adversity. He gave him to a place where he had to choose which one to accept. Long before you ever had a need for salvation, God arranged a supply for some other person's adversity. Amen? You can you can be like Joseph and you'll get right down through 20 years of adversity and he never got in a hurry with God. And Joseph knew that God had his address. Amen? Amen? Look at Job. What about Job? Let's go back there again. Read verses one, uh, 6 through 12 here. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And then the Lord said unto Satan, now watch this here, that, whence comest thou? And then Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and walking up and down in. So here's how I see this. I know Satan can't get back into the, the there's a part of heaven he can never come back into, amen? He got kicked out of that. So I see it like, like my grandma's house, okay? There was the, in the, in the house, and then there was a porch, and then there's the yard. And Satan got kicked out of the house into the yard. That's earth. But the Bible says that God, someone know that he came before God and talked to God. So I see my grandma like she would do, talk to people through the screen door. Okay? And so I see, like, Satan comes to the screen door. I know I can't get back in there. And God said, what are you up to, smutty face? He said, I'm walking to and fro throughout the whole earth, just walking up and down in it. And the Lord said to Satan, he says, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there's none like him in the earth? a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. And Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth, just, doth Job fear God for naught? Hast not thou made a hedge about him and about his house, about all that he has on every side? And thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance and his increase in the land? Satan said to God, Put forth thine hand now, God, and touch all that he has. He'll curse you to your face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he has is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. We all know what began to happen. Right, am I right? Chapter 2 takes place. After he's lost all of his wealth, well, I believe he lost his kids in chapter 1. I believe that's correct. Or maybe chapter 2. But then it says, Again, there was a day the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. Satan came also among them to present them before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, From whence comest thou? What are you up to, smutty face? And Satan answered, said, I'm going to and fro on the earth, from walking up and down inside of it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hey, have you considered my servant Job? That there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that fears God, a true as evil. And still he holds fast his integrity. All that's been going on is bad in his life. He is still holding fast his integrity, although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause. And Satan answered the Lord and said, okay, God, here's the deal. Skin for skin. All that a man has, he'll give for his life. In other words, you let him get sick and bad sick, and he'll, he'll, he'll turn his back. He said, but pour forth thy hand now and touch his bone and his flesh. He'll curse you to thy face. And the Lord said to Satan, behold, he's in thy hand. Save his life. Whose idea was it to allow Job to go through what he went through? Well, it was not probably it was. Does you remember what happened? It wasn't Satan's idea. The Bible says Satan just walked around and said, what are you up to? And then God says, I'm going to throw a name in the hat here. Have you God the Father said, Satan, have you considered my servant Job? When you have adversity, you've got to understand that you're God. He's charged. It's hard, isn't it? It was God's idea. It was God's idea. He lost his wealth. He lost his children. He lost his health. He lost his relationship with his friends and his wife. Can you hear me? 
I, I, you need to help your lips to say this, okay? It's hard for you to say this. Just say this, it was God's idea. Say it. And it was God's will. Amen? Look what Job said. Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. But I will maintain mine own ways and not his. Isn't that unbelievable? Let me give you a scenario. How old is your son? How old is he? How old are you? Let's just stick to these guys in this room. Okay? Ray? I'm going to make y'all 17 real fast, right? Okay? Is that a driver's license? No. Okay. Young 17 year old boy, your church, kidnapped by terrorists, taken to a Muslim country. Let's say you're taken. Leave church, I'll leave in here. You went outside. Came from your church. You came back from what country? From your boy. Think about this. Then you get a, a, a message from Muslims. You with me? You with me? He's taken from his parents. Taken from his religion, and they said to him, "Him, you don't get to keep your name. We're going to change your name." And while there, they do things to him to them so bad that they can never have children. Is that you? You hear me? You with me? Could this be the will of God for that boy? This be the will of God for your son. That puts it right down to the dirt, doesn't it? Talk to me. Wow. His name was Daniel. In the Bible. And we tell stories about how great his name was. But the greatness of Daniel came after he was kidnapped. After he was put into a Muslim country after he was abused and had children. All of that. And then we sit and cry about how wonderful and powerful Daniel still is. How do you think he still has a son? Perversion. See, what we want is we, this is adversity is God's way of paying for our advancement. It's so weird. Our advancement. God delivered him out of the lion's den to point one one wicked king to God and for God to get glory. And this is hard for us to wrap our brain around. If God uses me, runs me through the fire, and I suffer dearly, and one person gets saved, and I die after suffering for years, you know what God would say, brother? Or I've messed up. It's hard for you and I to say this because I got a boy, you got a boy. Best to go. That 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 would be worse. Okay. Somebody said, "Well, he went to the mission field and only had one son, and then he got forced to kill so and so." December twenty sixth, two thousand eight. Tell you a scenario, okay? Um, So our church has a printing manual, and um, in 2010, we were working on 3 million gospel tracts and 200,000 John and Romans in the language of Tamil. And the way we do our printing ministry is, we ask people when they go to Walmart, is they buy a ream of paper every time they go. And so our families go by Walmart, and they pick up reams of paper, and they bring them in. 
once we get a stack, a pretty good stack of it, like a pallet almost full, then we crank the press up and we start running gospel tracks. And um, but we're, it normally takes us, us, because we don't have big, heavy-duty printing presses or anything. It's not pretty um, uh, historical. Okay? Yeah. Antique. And, um, and so uh, it takes us about a year to get 300,000 300, 300, John Romans and 3 million tracks together. Put them in, in boxes. And then get a container to come and take them to India. That's what we go to the southern tip of India. But for some reason, we launched this. Now get this: we launched this this project in October of <clears throat> let me think here October of two thousand and eight. And for some reason, there, the whole church would forget to buy paper at Walmart. We go. We need paper, folks. They'd forget. Finally, a little bit crinkle in, it would. And then our presses kept breaking down. And then, I mean, a whole year went by, and then another year went by. We're over there trying to get these gospels out to India. I mean, you know, people are dying, going to hell in India. You know what I'm saying? You're trying to get this going. And then October of 2010 came, our missions conference came, and I told the church, what we're going to do is every day anybody that can during the Mission Conference, come down here and let's get these scriptures printed and packed and get them on the container. I'm going to go ahead and order the container to be here the last night of Mission Conference. And we worked 24-7 for three days, people in the print room. And people were literally crying. They were so tired. And they were I got video of people sitting there crying because they're so tired. And we're putting these John Romans together. And, so, and we just... The money didn't come in to help this thing. It was so long, so hard. But anyway, on that last night of the missions conference, we did our last case of track. We did our last case of John Romans, and we took it all. We loaded it into the container, and then we all stood. I got a video of this. We all stood around the container, and we're three days awake and working, and we're laying hands on the container. We're saying, oh, God, I don't know why you made us. Why didn't you? I mean, people are dying. They need the gospel now. And God, but God, here's this container, and we pray that you protect it like you did the Ark of the Covenant and get it where it needs to be. Well, anyway, the contract on the container, this is how it writes, they tell you the day it's going to be delivered in India. And the day it was going to be delivered was supposed, listen to me carefully, is um, it was supposed to be delivered on December the 26th in India. Okay? December 26th, and so then um, the container got there December 25th, okay? Don't miss this. A day early. And what happened was the men that were unloading the, the containers off the ship, they wanted to be to take off the latter part of the 25th. So they stayed the 25th on Christmas and unloaded these containers and they put our container in a warehouse. Stay with me. This is incredible. And our container was at the top of the stack of, of containers. I mean, way up in the air. Watch this. The day it was supposed to be delivered is December 26, 2010. It got there a day early, right? On the 26th, early that morning, that ship went out, and a tsunami took place in Indonesia. And that, that shook the earth underneath, and it caused a tsunami on the southern tip of India. And the waves came in, and a quarter of a million people got swept away and died in that tsunami. What's the point? See, I'm over in Iowa trying to figure out, why are you making me suffer? Why, why don't you help us get the gospel there? Why don't, you know what? God's hand was holding it back. You know why? And guess what? He not only was holding it back from getting done a year previous to that, he was holding it back. He was Then he sped it up so he'd get there a day earlier than what they said it would. And then God's sovereign hand put the container on the top so when the wave came in, our container did not get water on it. And guess what happened? 15,000 Christians were contacted about our container. And they went there, and they climbed on top of those containers and got those gospel tracts and those John Romans. And there's a quarter of a million dead bodies floating everywhere. 
and people are devastated. People's babies are gone, their husbands are gone, their wives are gone. People are standing around, don't know what to do. And guess what? They be- these Christians began to witness to these gospel tracts in John and Romans. <coughs> Gus was saying, well, he's in heaven now, but he was our missionary. He was a native. He said to this through an email. He said, Marvin, we're averaging 2,000 people coming to Christ every day from your container. And at the very end of it, after it all settled at dusk, he, called, he texted me or emailed me and said, Marvin, we had more people saved through your container than we lost in the tsunami. And here I'm going, why are you doing this? Why don't you hurry and get this container there? Why don't these people get the paper in here? Why don't you give me the money so I can get your job done, right? See, God's, God's what? He's sovereign. And so I'm just saying to you, God's sovereign in your addiction. And I'm glad God is sovereign in that. Don't, you see what I'm saying? When things go downward and bad, understand this. God's doing a work. Amen? Let's pray together, okay? Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, and I'd like just to ask you a few questions and give it a quick invitation tonight. I know I talk a long time, but um, it's uh, we've, we've only been here an hour and ten minutes, or no, we've been more than that. I'm sorry, an hour and a half. Okay. How many of you are sitting here right now and say, I've been through the fire, the time of fire, the depth All over the place. Say it's time of fire. How many of you, you know, maybe somewhere in that, you, you, in that time, you were, you could sense bitterness, difficulty. You couldn't. It was difficult for you. You were kind of getting aggravated with God. How many of you have ever been there? Say, been there. How many right now are going through stuff? You say, preacher, I'm going through it. I need prayer. You slip your hand. Okay. Miss, will you pray right there? Here's what I want you to do. Let's as a church. If you're here tonight and you say, I'm going through it, would you bring your adversity to this altar? Just kneel down and say, God, I'm going to put you where you should be. You're in charge of my adversity. You're in charge of it all. Just come right now. Let me coach you a little bit here. If you're bitter because of adversity toward anybody, and I want you to resolve right here. You know, God, I'm not going to stay bitter. You may be mad at somebody over something. You may be mad at yourself. You may be mad at God. Right here in this altar, I want you to tell God, God, I want you to get glory through my adversity. I want you to get glory through my adversity. I want you to know I can trust you. I can trust you when I can't see in front of me. I can trust you when I don't understand my path. I can trust you because you're in charge of all adversity. Ask God just to show you where you got upset. Ask God to heal you where you got wounded. 